بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه. I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to this uh, special family night. Inshallah, it will be a great program. We have two uh, great speakers, guests with us today. Uh, I'm sure you will enjoy uh, listening to them and you will learn something uh, that will help us and help our community, uh, inshallah. Um, just quickly, the program is going to be um, to uh, listen to the two speakers and after they're done, as you exit, we will give you uh, green tickets uh, so that you can have your uh, free dinner, inshallah, outside. Um, I'm going to start with uh, Brother Khalil. Okay, Brother Khalil Meek is one of the founders, original founders of the Muslim Legal Fund of America. It's a great organization. If you were here during Juma uh, prayer today, uh, you heard him speak about it a little bit during the khutbah. Uh, it's a wonderful organization that serves uh, all Muslims throughout the United States, including our community. They have done wonderful work and have won many large federal cases um, in court. And some of them were here in Florida. Uh, you'll hear about these wonderful success stories. And it's a wonderful organization. So without further ado, I want to ask uh, Brother Khalid to come to the mic. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa ala alayhi wa sallam wa sallam. Good evening everyone and salam alaikum. Alhamdulillah. It's my honor to be here tonight uh, with Sister Linda uh, and all of you to uh, share with you uh, some information uh, about the work that we're doing with the Muslim Legal Fund, uh, the impact that we're having, and especially uh, to hear from Linda about the work she's doing and the impact she's having. So uh, we hope that uh, tonight's program is uh, one that you'll remember and that uh, you'll appreciate the time you, you spend with us. One of the things we mentioned at Juma today is the importance of justice in Islam, but as I said, I'm one of the founders of a charity called the Muslim Legal Fund, and since 9-11, when this organization was founded. I don't know if you know this, but in December of 2001, President Bush came out on national TV and he declared with an executive order that the eight largest Muslim charities in the United States were funding terror and he closed them. So with the stroke of his pen on December 2001, he shut down the eight largest Muslim charities in America. He shut down the Holy Land Foundation, but he also shut down Benevolence, Kind Hearts, Global Relief, the eight largest Muslim relief organizations in America were closed the day he signed that executive order. And then he ordered the Office of Foreign Assets Control, OFAC, to do an investigation to prove him right. So he declared them terrorist organizations, he said they're funding terror overseas, and he said, now, OFAC, seize their assets, do an investigation, and prove that I'm right. So he started with a conclusion. That investigation and that process took over eight years. So from 2001 to 2008, almost 2009, the Office of Foreign Asset Control raided the Holy Land, took all their stuff, put it in the truck, and started an investigation. Global Relief, Kind Hearts, Benevolent, did the same thing. And over that period of time, some of the organizations had legal issues. So the Holy Land had to end up dealing with feeding children in Palestine that the government claimed was criminal in nature because they thought somehow it helped, Pal it helped Hamas. Other charities, that were shut down had no legal issues, nothing ever happened. Other charities, like Kind Heart, sued the government for the process. They said, this is wrong. You declare us a, a designated organization, you seize our assets, freeze our bank account, take all of our stuff, and then you start to investigate. So they sued the government, said, this is backwards. You can't even do this. 
Their lawsuit suit took eight years, and they finally won that lawsuit in 2008. So Kind Heart sued the government and won. Some organizations, nothing. Holy Land had to deal with some legal issues. After eight years, though, all eight organizations died. So think about that. Whether you win, lose, or tie, you die. All eight are dead today. When 2001 happened, the United States government has what's called a security watch list. The government's job is to keep us safe. They had over, around two to 3,000 people on this watch list prior to 9-11. Two to three thousand people. After 9-11, if you look at the list in 2009, there were eight different agencies that can put an individual on a watch list. It takes articulable suspicion. That's like a policeman asking you, can I help you? Are you lost? Your name, your ethnicity, your country of origin, any of these could put you on a watch list. It's you don't have to do anything. Just who you are could put you on a watch list. Dead people, babies, elderly, people have been on these watch lists. That list started at two to 3,000 people prior to 9-11. It exploded at 224,000 in 2009. 224,000 people by 2009. By 2013, it had gone to 448,000 in 2013. In 2018, it's over 1 million. What we see happening post 9-11 is a rise in government security measures to keep us safe that are infringing on civil liberties everywhere. It affects people in immigration, it affects people in civil, where they're trying to travel, when they're crossing borders, when they're banking, and their job employment. It happens in criminal, when people are trying to do noble, con I mean, noble efforts, and they twist noble conduct into criminal behavior. All of these issues started after 9-11, and we had imams, leaders, activists, organizations having to deal with some of the most serious legal issues our community had ever faced. And at the time, there was no organization that existed that was capable of dealing with these issues. So the Muslim Legal Fund was a group of activists, including myself and Dallas, who said, well, living in America, there's one thing we can all do. Anybody in this room can do. You can open a legal fund for anything, at any time, whenever you want. You don't need permission. Just open a legal fund. However, if you want it to be tax exempt, this is a cloud eligible, you want it to be something that can uh, be a public legal fund, then you have to go through the process of getting it tax exempt. So we said, why don't we create a tax exempt charity that can create legal funds for any legal issue? That way the community, if it has something, someone they care about, then we can help them facilitate that legal work. And that allowed us, after creating the Muslim Legal Fund, to help people anywhere in the country. So people would call from New York, Chicago, Michigan, LA, Miami, Seattle, Dallas, anywhere in the country and share with us the concern they had, the issue they had, and we could help them create a legal fund. We would go find the best lawyers in the country to deal with the issue. We would sign the contract, be liable to pay them. But the community would say, we'll help you fund the, the, the effort by mobilizing the community to fund it. So together we funded legal work for 14 years called case funding. And as we began funding legal work, when no other organization in the U.S. was able to do that, we learned an awful lot about the U.S. legal system. And I want to stop here and share with you some conclusions 
that even I learned about the legal system. I grew up in America. I'm an American citizen, born in a Christian family and took Shahada in 1989. So I should know more about the legal system than any immigrant. But I didn't know nearly what I know today. I'm going to share that with you. How powerful is the legal system in America? As we all understand politics, if we get elected, we make the rules. That's pretty powerful. If, we're, if we can have affluence in, in numbers and we can uh, have our presence felt in all of our societal institutions, that's power. When it comes to legal, I thought that's something you try to avoid in this country. Right? Don't run a red light, pay your taxes, and stay out of trouble. That's as much legal as I wanted. But when you look at how the system works, think about this. You have two major parties in America, powerful political parties, Republicans and Democrats. They make all the rules, they write all the laws, yet when it comes time to appoint a judge to the Supreme Court, why do they care? Judges do not make any rules. They don't write any laws. Why does it matter to them who sits on the Supreme Court? Why does it matter? Huh? Interpret the law. I thought law was black and white. Who has to interpret law? Huh? Isn't it yes or no? I mean, can't you just read and, and decide whether something's legal or not? Huh? How they understand it, and they can make the judgment according to them. Let, let's, let's take an example we all understand. Let's take the religion of Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the Muslims perfect law, the Quran. From the Creator to me, Allah said, This is your entire religion, it's perfected. Right? Perfect law. Then Allah says, that's not enough. I'm going to send you the Prophet, peace be upon him. I'm going to send you the application of law. Perfect sunnah. How do you apply the law? Perfect. Right? The application of the law. Perfect law, perfect sunnah. Okay? If I invited a hundred judges to Pompano, and I said, here's a couple of facts. Take the Quran and sunnah, give me fatwa. Perfect law, perfect sunnah. Do I get the same fatwa from all 100 scholars? Huh? Perfect law, perfect sunnah, still different fatwas. America, you need to think of America as a religion. Think of it as a religion. The laws are man-made. They're not, they're not divine, but they're laws that govern everything we do. And they're not perfect by any means. And the way those laws are applied in a courtroom and different courtrooms all over the country for 200 years, that becomes the sunnah. It is not the same and it's not perfect. So very imperfect law, very imperfect sunnah. Now when you go to court, you have two lawyers who are going to take a set of facts and one lawyer is going to take those facts in this law and this sunnah and tell a jury that's never been in a courtroom, never read a law book, never studied anything, and they're going to sit there and listen to this lawyer tell them about these facts, this law and this sunnah, what to think. This other lawyer is going to tell them that that lawyer is crazy, that the same facts, the same law and the same sunnah think exactly the opposite. The judge is a referee to make sure you have a fair fight. That's the only thing the judge does. Lawyers in America are the equivalent of scholars in Islam. You follow? How important are scholars in Islam? How important are lawyers in America? Are all scholars the same? Are all lawyers the same? What makes them different? <laughs> Ethnicity. <laughs> what makes them different? Yeah. 
I mean, a lot of things go into that. So what we've learned is that in this country, America set up what's called an adversarial system through the legal process. It's not supposed to, it's a, it's a civil process that's supposed to facilitate every adversarial situation. Meaning every time you disagree, every time there's a problem, every time there's an issue, the recourse is court for everything. And when you go to court, it's a fight, but it's civil with a pen. Everything. You don't fight about anything. You don't shoot each other. You don't steal from each other. You don't punch each other. Right? No. Everything goes to court. Everything. Even the food. You have to put labels on. Everything is legal. 100%. So every step we take in this country is legal. So if you want to engage in America with power, with influence, with clout, there is no way to do it other than with pen and a lawyer. Do you understand that? If Congress makes all the rules and you interpret all the law, who wins? lawyers. They write all the rules, you enforce everything with a pen. Legal power is real. Not only is it real, you can create as much legal power as you want in the shortest amount of time with nobody interfering. Nobody has to approve it. Nobody has to elect it. It's not a majority rules kind of deal. It's your, you can study law, become lawyers, judges, you can hire the best, create the best. And in this country, Think about it this way. They say you get to pick your scholar to advocate for you in court. In other words, take the law, take the summa, take the facts, and apply them to you how you see best. It'd be like in Islam if we said, why don't we invite the Hindus, the Buddhists, the atheists, and the agnostics to run the country? Tell us how to implement Sharia. Well, they'd probably try. But they're not invested in it. It's not personal to them. It's not their faith. So wouldn't you rather have someone who who's Muslim and who understands you and everything about the law and how it applies to you? Do you follow me? The reason I go on this tangent is I need the Muslim community to understand that the law is not something like I used to think avoid it, and no news is good news, but we should embrace it so that we have a philosophy, if you mess with one of us, you will deal with all of us. That's power. Do we know a community in America that functions that way? Is it effective? What does Allah tell us? If you mess with one of us, deal with Allah. Allah says that works. Well, no place does it work better than here. Okay. So because we have these issues, because we created a legal fund, because we understood a little bit about the legal system, we said, hey, now it's time for us to really put together a core of talent so that we can start to build power for Muslims in a strategic way in this country so that just like Thurgood Marshall for the NAACP or the ADL or the Catholic Church, they started to focus on their issues and building legal power until they changed their condition. We can do the same thing. So what the Muslim Legal Fund did in 2014, when we had over 15,000 Muslims who had given us money, raising about $2 million a year, we said, look, Let's just handpick you know, some of the best lawyers that we know now that we've got great rapport with and start a, lead, a, a law firm. And if we can create a nonprofit law firm and start getting people to work full time instead of by the hour, we can do it cheaper, we can do it better, we can institutionalize the knowledge, we can bring in young attorneys and train them and work under senior attorneys. And everything that we do is ours, not some private attorneys. And there's a lot of efficiencies that happen when you create your own law center. So it looks good on paper, now how do you make it happen? 
And in Juma, I told you that we ended up hiring a lawyer named Charles Swift, who's a retired lieutenant commander from the United States Navy, a military JAG, Judge Advocate Court, was counsel for the Northwest and Southeast Division of the Navy, nominated to be general counsel to the entire Navy. <coughs> what I didn't tell you is while I was in the military, the U.S. captured a Muslim named Salam Hamdan, put Salam in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, and then assigned Charlie to be Salam's lawyer. Anybody knew who Salam was? Salam was the driver of Osama bin Laden. So Charlie defended Salam. And once he got to know Salam and started defending him, he became so adamant about his innocence, he defended him so vigorously, the case escalated to the U.S. Supreme Court, ended up being Donald Rumsfeld, then the Secretary of Defense against Salam. Charlie ended up winning the case. The driver went home to Yemen to his family. After winning that case, Charlie upset a lot of folks in the military. Uh, he ended up retiring from the military after serving 20 years in his early 40s and opened up his own law firm in Seattle, Washington. When he opened his law firm in Seattle, there's 1.2 million lawyers in the U.S. and they themselves ranked Charlie as one of the top 100 lawyers in the U.S., one of the brightest legal minds in the country. And then amongst civil attorneys, which he's considered, they said he's the second leading civil attorney in the U.S. And starting in 2014, we began to work with Charlie as a private attorney and paying him by the hour. And then in 2000, I'm sorry, 2008 when he opened his law firm, till 2014. And then in 2014, he agreed to be the director of our new law center and moved from Seattle to Dallas and began to hire a staff of lawyers to work full-time for the community. And since 2014 till now, he's hired senior attorneys, staff attorneys, litigation fellows, paralegals, third-year law students. We spent four and a half million dollars last year creating a legal team in Dallas, Texas, that now works for Muslims nationwide for free on immigration, civil, and criminal at the federal level. And we focus on national security cases that have civil liberty infringements. So anything that I spoke about earlier where a national security program affects your civil liberties, whether it's no-fly, quad S, border crossing, bank closures, uh, immigration issues, denial, citizenship revocations, anything in that entire arena is what we focus on. And right now, I would say that the law center we have not only has more experience and more capability, than any Muslim organization on these issues, than any law firm in America on these issues. And I'll try to back that up with some of the cases uh, that we've uh, been handling in closing. Before I do, I want to share with you another service that we offer. When Charlie found out from the IRS in 2016, that over 300 Muslim nonprofits had lost their tax exempt status uh, from the year 2011 to 2015. So, in a four year window, when our charities fell under regulatory scrutiny, we weren't doing very well. 300 of our mosques, schools, relief organizations lost their tax exempt status when regulatory scrutiny was shining on them. To help in that arena, we did a nationwide search and hired a nonprofit business attorney named Sherry Crittenden, who's a former general was the former general counsel to the United Negro College Fund in Washington, D.C. They're the largest minority funding institution in the U.S. She's a 24-year senior nonprofit business attorney, um, licensed in the U.S. Supreme Court, and had previously managed a $1.6 billion Bill Gates grant to the African American colleges and universities throughout the U.S. and her job was to keep these nonprofits in compliance with 501c3 and grant funding. So Charlie asked her, could she move from D.C. to Dallas, do what she's always done, but for the Muslim community. And after a pilot project in Dallas for three months, in January of 2017, she accepted the position, moved to Dallas, and we started sharing with our community that if you want Sherry's help, she can help you with governance, risk, compliance with the 501c3 uh, nonprofit for free, and it's attorney-client privilege, so whatever issues you might have or don't have, she can help you get from where you are to where you need to be, so engage with the law center. As she got to know the community, 
she started telling us that, hey, Khalil, everybody I meet in your community is sending money overseas to their family or to some project they care about or people they care about. And I only do domestic compliance. I'm not versed in international charitable giving. But she recommended that we offer something to help our donors and our organizations with relief work or international charitable giving. At the same time, Trump got elected in November of 2016, and we received phone calls from all the national organizations who got, I would say, uh, deja vu and chill bumps, thinking that we remember what happened in December of 2001 when George Bush, just with the stroke of his pen, shut down the eight largest charities. Trump said a lot of things that were negative about Islam and Muslims. What if he decides to be aggressive, ugly, with the Muslims, and he does something like that? What if he designates a new group of uh, uh, people, then based on that designation says, I believe something is, uh, some association exists between you and this group, and orders OFAC to do a blocking order, seize your assets pending investigation. Right, so if he designates the Brotherhood, or some Syrian organization, or a Yemeni organization, or a Palestinian organization, or a, uh, an Afghani organization, any organization, and then said, based on this designation, I think there's some association do the exact same thing that happened in 2001. So we got phone calls from all the national organizations saying, come to our next board meeting. We want to talk to you. So we went to their board meetings, and they said, what can we do that's proactive now in case something? They said, it's not happened, but what if it does? What have we learned since 2001 till today that could make that outcome any different? Is there anything that could be done? And from what we've learned since 2001 till today, we said there's a ton of things you can do different. So there's many things. And we told them all the headaches that happened from 2001 to 2008 and things that could have strengthened all the nonprofits. And then we got down to the one thing that all of them said, that's what we want to do. And Charlie said, well, what you can do is pretend like your worst nightmare is going to happen. Just assume it's going to happen. Why don't you right now, today, respond to that blocking order in writing and be ready to give it to the judge the next day? You follow me? Is this boring? Okay. This will have a lot of relevance in two seconds. When OFAC came the first time in 2001, they knock on your door, you don't know they're coming, they tell everybody to go home, they didn't arrest anybody, they take all your stuff, put it in a truck and start an investigation. When you figure out what's going on, they say, well, you are now been blocked by the, designated by the president, pending investigation. They're like, no, we're not. And you go and look for a lawyer. And when you find a lawyer, you say, okay, I'll write you a check. They go, no, your funds are frozen. You can't use your money. So you're like, okay, we've got to find some money. I go find some money. I find a lawyer. I say, okay, now represent me. The lawyer says, where's your stuff? It's, it's somewhere with the Department of Justice. He says, well, I can't write a response to a blocking order without having all your paperwork. So he has to ask for it back. And they say, well, some of it's top secret. You can't see your own statements. Eventually, you'll start getting pieces back over years. There's no time limit. There's no compulsion on them on when you get it. So this drags on for eight years before you can even put something together, right? So now you finally file something. Eight years later, you're already dead. The public's walked away years ago. It doesn't matter when, lose, or draw. So Charlie said, write a response today who you are, how you function, whatever. You already know the rhetoric based on your own ethnicity, how you function, what it will be. And then if it happens, just hand it to the judge the next morning. Here, we're not associated. We function open and transparent. This is who we are. This is how we do business. He said, what that will do is put the onus now on OFAC. Now, instead of an open investigation with no time limit, they have to give you an answer of what they're going to find before they look, because they're on the clock, just like Trump's blocking order, he, uh, his travel ban. He banned all these countries, but the next day he was sued by Hawaii, uh, Washington, the ACLU, many other organizations saying they had people's civil liberties would be violated, put a restraining order on his executive order until it went through the courts. Same thing, you file the next day, now it changes into a very short window, burdens on OFAC or the blocking orders lifted and you move on. Everybody said, can you do that? He said, yes, I can, I can write a blocking order. But not for 33 or 50 chapters or 22 chapters or all these different groups of organizations and each one of you need a blocking order written, it's too big, too many of you. But they wanted us to do that. Sherry said we needed to do relief work overseas for our donors. So we ended up 
saying, okay, we can put a department together to do that, but we need an OFAC attorney, an FDIC attorney, we need Sherry, we need Charlie. So we now have a compliance department that can do that for our donors, our relief organizations.